Hello, everyone. Um, can you hear me? I see the other speakers are already in the room. Felix is there. I don't know if the IGF volunteers are here too. Okay, thanks, Rachel. So a quick message first to IGF organizers. Um, could you put as co-hosts um, me first and uh, my colleague Anastasia Kazakova, who is also here in the in the room. Hello, Arno. Hello, Christina. Nice to hear you. Hello to everyone. Hi, Nastya. Hello, hello. Hi, this is Rachel. Hi, Rachel. Uh, Hi, this is Philip. Hello, Philip. Hello. Uh, hello, this is Sanjana. Hello, everyone. So I think all the panelists are here. Can I ask you to put your camera on to make sure it works? I don't know how to do it. I... <laughs> yeah, I think we need to be promoted to panelist because right now it looks like we're only in. Different now. Yeah, I can Hi. see. Yeah. I can see people. That should be good now. And and Felix is also leaving the message that he doesn't have button yet to share the screen. Hello. Hi. Hi everyone. Nice hey to meet there. you all. Um, there is just uh, Mr. Abil Nash Nair. Um, I'm sorry, I will deactivate you so that we don't see your your screen here. Um, I don't know if the IGF um, volunteers can do that um, so that we don't see the screens of non-panelists. That would be great if it's possible. Thanks. Thanks I don't know what to, how to do that from my end. I'll try. Thank Abinash. Okay, we just have uh, five to ten minutes before the meeting starts. Uh, well, as you can see, uh, the attendees are some attendees are already in the room. Um, so just a quick update. I think we have around 65 attendees registered to the Zoom meeting and others will probably join through YouTube. Uh, so I hope we'll have many people. Thank you everyone for joining and taking some time. Um, can I ask you just to maybe say a few words to make sure we can hear you well and everything's fine on the technical side? Um, so Hi Christina, everyone, yeah. yes, I start, hope you're fine. Perfect. Uh, Philippe, I see you already unmuted. Do you want to go ahead? Oh, yeah, yeah, sure. Uh, well, welcome. You know, thanks for having us and uh, uh, looking forward to the discussions. Thank you. I'll have some water. Thanks. Uh, Rachel? I'm here. Thank you. 
Excellent. And Sanjana? Uh, hello, uh, everyone. And I hope you can hear me clearly. Uh, yes, the sound is a bit low, I think. If you okay. maybe can speak closer to the mic, that would be great. Um, and the last one is Felix. Felix, no, can, you just, can you just do a quick check with the video? Uh, I can't. So I, I will try to restart uh, Zoom on my Mac because wait, uh, all the option even. No, no, wait the... a moment. Let me do you a presenter. Well, Felix has left. Mm. Um, uh, yeah. Okay. <laughs> now it's better, yeah. Okay, Felix, if you agree, I will deactivate your camera for now. I mean, or you can yeah. deactivate it. Maybe just to introduce uh, Felix, uh, he's also one of our colleagues. Uh, you may have seen it in the briefing and he will do um, the short demo on the anti-stalker uh, box. He's one of our um, security expert researchers. Uh, and uh, I hope you can hear me clearly now. It's better, San Sanjana. Thank you. Um, so one last message to IGA volunteers. Thanks a lot for your help, by the way. Uh, thanks a lot for dedicating some time. Um, it's just that I see that some people are in the panelist list, but they will not be speakers. Well, maybe through questions, but uh, I don't know how to remove them. If you could remove remove Abilash, Ella, Anda, and Rosanna, that would be great. Uh, hello, I'm unable to. Um, can you add me to the panelists? I think uh, I've become the attendee. Good afternoon, good morning, good evening. My name is Adebo Akimbo. Kindly please um, um, clarify so that I can know who to remove on the panelists. As I ask Zana back, Zana, my apologies. Hi, um, I, I'm not sure I understood anything. You are a panelist now? Yes, uh, now I am. Our mod, kindly please indicate who I need to remove. Ah, yes. If Thank we are you. okay with it, then I can move ahead. Well, I, I think the, the list of panelists is good now. Um, I don't know if it's possible to remove the screens of non panelists. So that would be Abilash, um, Abilash Nair, Anda Soluna, Ruzana Meretuk, and I can see the end of the name, and Ella Seri. So, Abilash, Anda, Rosanna, and Ella. Thank you. If it's possible to see only the, the pictures and videos of the panelists, 
that would be perfect. I think that's not the case, I know if I uh, look at the screen and everything. I'm just wondering if uh, Felix, uh, you also now are good with the presentation button to share the screen. Okay. Yeah, yeah I, I can if you want, just to test. Yeah, uh, why not? Up oh, this one. You mm -hmm. see it? You started it and um, I guess it takes a bit before it comes oh. up. I have something. Where is my mouse? Uh, ah, okay. I'm going to have to stop. PowerPoint magic. This moment. Uh, okay, so that's Oh, I think it's okay. Yes. Perfect. Perfect. Excellent. I will just try the same for the slides for the very beginning. Can you see my screen? Yep. Excellent. Mm, I think this one is not not better than the one before. Sorry. Wow. Um, we see exactly the same like you. So like the with the diapositives we want. You have to switch the screens. So we're seeing the presenter view. We need to see the mm. other. View. Rachel is the <laughs> expert on. Yes, Zoom. you're the technology expert. Yes. No, just done too many presentations in the last six months. <laughs> okay. Do you know how I can switch screens? Yes. Yeah, so um, if you go back to that view, you can do it. I don't, I don't think this might be in French, so I don't read that. But I think if you go back to presenter view. Like to the black, to the black screen that, thing? Yep. Yeah, so, yeah. And then... I think it is the maybe that second one param parameters, and then yeah. that arrow. Yeah, now there it's done. Go. Okay, thanks, thanks, yeah. Rachel. Sure. Okay, we'll just wait for two minutes. I think. Um, one question to IGA volunteers: Will you let us know when to start? Thank you so much. Um, I would like to remind all the participants that this session will be, is recorded and hosted under the IGF Code of Conduct and the United Nations Rules and Regulation. If you wish to make your contribution once the time is appropriate, please kindly, you'll be allowed to talk at, the, at that point in time. At that point in time, you'll be respect, expected to raise up your hand uh, the MOG of the AND, so as to be identified by the moderator to take the floor. You state your name first for the record before your contribution. Please enjoy the session. Uh, co uh, host, host should please go on to um, transmit the session live now. Thank you. Thank you very much. So should we wait for another 15 seconds? And let's go. I don't know. Will we have uh, mic mics uh, muted or unmuted? 
you manage it yourself? We advise that we try as much as possible to mute ourselves. Thank you. Okay, good, thanks. Okay, so I think we can start now. Uh, I hope we have many people in the room. I, I can see that now, but uh, I'm sure it's the case. So hello everyone. Thank you very much for joining our IGF pre-event uh, entitled Stop Stalk Aware, Tackling Digital Stalking Helps Victims of Domestic Violence. Uh, my name is Arnaud Dechou and I'm Public Affairs Manager at Kaspersky based in Paris. So I have the pleasure to moderate today uh, our session uh, dedicated to the issue of stalk aware you may have heard of, may not have heard of the term stalker world, uh, also called sometimes sportswear or other names, and which refers to a growing problem uh, in our societies uh, today, but a problem which uh, really lacks awareness. So the objective of today's session is precisely to raise awareness, help protect users, and identify multi-stakeholders activities to counter these developing cyber threats. So thank you very much to the Internal Government Forum, the IGF, for having us here. We have the chance um, to be here with a panel of four experts from different horizons, uh, working in different fields all around the globe. Three of them are members of the International Coalition Against Stockerware, which was created one year ago. And with their own perspectives, they will share with us their thoughts, on what we can do together against uh, digital stalking in domestic violence. After that, security researcher Felix Aimé um, will give us uh, a very first live demo of a project that he has initiated uh, to help local stakeholders um, identify stalkerwares, the open source anti stalker box. Um, and all of the speakers will be available to answer your questions during the second part of the, of the event dedicated to a QA. and a So before we start, uh, two quick technical points. Throughout the event, you can raise questions in the Q&A section on Zoom. Um, and you can also comment and raise questions on Twitter, especially if you're not connected through Zoom, but uh, through YouTube or by phone. So in that case, please, please use this hashtag, Stop uh, So let's get started. Let me remove this slide. Um, so our first panelist is uh, Christina Jankowski. Um, Christina, you also work uh, for the cybersecurity company Kaspersky as a senior manager for external relation. Uh, you are based in Germany, in Berlin. And um, one of your key issues uh, is stock aware. And you are deeply involved in the work of the coalition uh, since it was created. So to begin you with, um, can you tell us a bit more of what is Stockware exactly, uh, what we can do ag uh, against it, and what is the objective of the creation of the coalition? Thanks a lot. Yes, thank you, Arno, and hello to everyone at the session. So let's first clarify some facts and figures around Stockware. Um, when talking about stalkerware, we speak of commercially available software that allows someone to digitally spy on the private life of somebody else. So stalkerware enables tracking a person's movements via GPS, monitoring their calls, their messages on any messenger you can think of, seeing their pictures that they take, everything they do in social networks and any other action that is taken on their phone. And the abuser secretly spies on the victim. So it means without victims know or without that they gave their consent because stalkerware runs hidden in the background of the device. So it's very difficult for the affected users to know that their device is infected. And unfortunately, it's fairly easy to install stalkerware on the victim's phone. And therefore stalkerware is often used in the area of domestic violence and takes place in relationships or former relationships. And what is very worrying is that we see in our Kaspersky statistics that the use of stalkerware is an increasing tendency spread over the world. So in 2019, we detected on global level an increase of 67% of stalkerware on our users' mobile devices compared to the year before. 
And in this year, so 2020 so far, we have documented over 48,000 installations of such software worldwide, again, just on the devices of our users. And what we also can see is that the leading countries, so the most affected ones are Russia, Brazil, the US, India, Mexico, and Germany. So we can see that this is truly a global problem. And we're not the only ones to see this picture. When we started to, when we started to look more into this issue, we also started to talk with other cybersecurity vendors and also with nonprofit organizations working in the field of domestic violence. And they see a similar picture. So we have come to understand that stalkerware is not only a technical problem, but it's actually a global social problem. And therefore, the Coalition Against Stalkerware was founded last year by 10 organizations from the area that I mentioned before. So IT security industry advocacy and nonprofit groups working with victims and perpetrators of domestic violence. And our joint aim is to fight the digital abuse and violence enabled by stalkerware and to raise public awareness about this problem. Thank you. Thank you very much, Christina, for this quick introduction. Uh, these are very impressive figure and very worrying one also. Um, so and as you say, the, the link with the overall topic of domestic violence is an important question. So to answer that, we have uh, the pleasure to welcome Rachel Gibson. Hi, Rachel. Um, thanks for being here. Uh, you are a senior technology uh, safety specialist at NNDEV, which is the national network to end domestic violence. Um, you live in Washington, DC, and you work to increase the safety and privacy of survivors and victims of crime. Um, in particular, you provide trainings and technical assistance uh, to build the capacity of victim service provider, private industries, and communities at large uh, to provide advocacy to survivors uh, in this digital society. So Rachel, um, what are the intersections exactly with domestic violence? And how is abuse and intimate partner violence going digital today? Wonderful, thank you all for having me. So when we think about domestic violence victims, domestic violence victims are not a monolith. They're not all the same. Whether they live in the US or Ghana, whether they're wealthy or working class, whatever their gender identity, domestic violence affects every community. And when we think about the ways in which this pandemic has shifted how victims and survivors get help, their ability to flee, and even the ways in which they experience violence, we, as Christina has eloquently said before me, have seen increases to that. Domestic violence can manifest in many different ways. Uh, it doesn't always appear as physical abuse. It can be emotional, religious, financial, threats to immigration status, outing someone for their identity and more. But we know that whatever that violence looks like, it's always rooted in power and control. One person wanting to exert power over another. And the ways in which technology facilitated abuse is just uh, one aspect of that abuse that a survivor may experience. It's important for us to remember that the technology facilitated abuse are old uh, behaviors with new tactics. So um, when we think about abuse, abuse was happening way before stalkerware, spyware, partnerware, whatever you wanna call it. It was happening way before those things were ever created. And so it really is rooted in what those behaviors are and technology like stalkerware has given abusers new access and abilities to get to victims. Tech abuse can look like stalkerware, spyware, harassing emails, uh, locating someone through a GPS, uh, threatening to distrib distribute intimate images online, as well as surveillance. And you know, we all use some form of technology. Survivors are using technology. And when survivors are using technology, they're constantly having to evaluate the risks to that tech. That means if survivors are communicating with family and friends, talking to victim service providers about fleeing, researching what abuse is, and someone is using stalkerware to monitor them, a person using stalkerware will be able to identify that their power and control is either shifting or waning. Um, and this could actually increase the violence that a victim is experiencing. Using stalkerware to facilitate abuse is just like I said, another tool. 
but stalkerware can make survivors feel like there's no help, like someone's always watching them, like they don't have many options. For many survivors that we've worked with, it can feel overwhelming and daunting to try to figure out how someone who shouldn't know that much about you knows what feels like everything about you. And survivors are having the safety plan around stock aware, not only for their lives, but the lives of their children and family. But it's also, and lastly, important for me to say that, again, there are risks to technology that survivors have to be aware of, um, and that misuse can make survivors feel scared, but survivors still have a right to technology. The ways that this pandemic has increased isolation and control um, uh, exerted by an abuser um, has, has, has manifested itself through uh, the stay at home orders, through survivors not being able to go to work and, and, and leave and flee. And so survivors having access to safe internet, safe phones, safe devices means that they can stay connected, reach out for help, and most importantly, be empowered to make the best decision for themselves. It's important for all of us working together to develop strategies to hold abusers accountable, making sure that the products we create do not cause harm. And if they do, make sure that we're working together to correct them. When we build products with survivors and victims in mind at the beginning, we make that product better for not just survivors, but for every user of that product. Our work means that we are creating technology and tools that empower survivors to make the best decisions for themselves. When this is done, whether we are an advocate, a technologist, a civil society member, um, whatever our job, whatever our role is, uh, we each play a part in this and we each do our part to end violence for all survivors. Thank you, Rachel. Thanks a lot for this overview and showing us as, that Stokora is only one aspect of uh, violence, digital violence in the frame of domestic violence, but still a, a very important one today. Uh, we will come back to the fact that we need to act, act together to bring effective response uh, to this issue. Um, before that, I'd like to uh, welcome our third speaker, uh, Sanjana Rathi. Uh, Sanjana, um, you are working for the Cyber Peace Foundation and Technology Against Crime Africa. Um, you work in the domain of technology and policy. Uh, you have worked previously with international law enforcement, think tank academia, and the private sector in Singapore, Israel, UK, and in India. And your domain is uh, in cybersecurity, technology, innovation, and business development. You are calling us today from Bangalore uh, in India, where you live. And I think we'll, you will give us some uh, feedback from uh, local experience you have uh, in India and elsewhere. So thanks a lot, Sanjana. Go ahead. Thank you so much. Um, so I would actually begin with uh, uh, the case that during the COVID-19 crisis, we, we have seen uh, an uh, increase in the use of stockware, a 51% increase, uh, statistics say. And also there has been an increase in domestic violence. Uh, however, the solution to this issue uh, and many other issues of crime, especially against women and children, uh, was grim because stockware was used by criminals and offenders uh, to make the vulnerability communities captive uh, with the use of these tools. Uh, it must be noted that initially there, was, uh, there were unreported cases where women facing domestic violence were unable to reach out to the relevant authorities because their phones and emails were hijacked uh, with the use of these spywares. Um, and therefore, stockware not only led to domestic violence, uh, but also it uh, defends the perpetrators of such violence. And uh, this is like a vicious cycle and this needs to be broken. It can only happen using a multi-stakeholder approach. Uh, this is also a sheer violation of uh, human rights, basic human rights. And uh, this needs uh, to be uh, uh, taken into consideration by the society as a whole and even the international community. Uh, the use of stockware uh, is very difficult to recognize and investigate and also assess and prevent uh, because it is not like the obvious crimes. And uh, like domestic violence, uh, often it is not taken seriously by uh, the local authorities also. 
uh, because it is seen as uh, an everyday courtship or an intimate uh, relationship and the use of stock aware in fact it, in fact it is even generalized as one of the norms in society uh, where uh, stock aware or stalking is seen as uh, um, as a, a part of the daily activities even in movies and serials and uh, uh, you know the the content that people watch and uh, so this also needs to be uh, taken into consideration when we are having when we are developing a holistic framework to counter uh, this kind of uh, an issue and the crimes associated with it uh, i would also now uh, like to touch upon uh, the aspects and, and the signs to recognize uh, stock aware so uh, for example if uh, the device is per performing abruptly or ex unexpectedly worse or uh, if there is uh, sudden frequent crashes and uh, uh, freezes of the mobile phone then it means that the stock aware is in uh, installed in the phone and the mobile device uh, there is also, if there is uh, sudden pop-ups and error messages uh, from programs, then uh, that means that there is spyware uh, which is installed in the phone and people need to be very aware of uh, these kind of uh, abrupt change in their mobile, uh, I would say. Um, also, knowing the basic cyber hygiene and various practices associated with cyber hygiene is uh, very much a necessary in society. Uh, uh, in order to uh, secure your phone against any kind, kind of an unauthorized physical access, uh, people need to be aware of the malicious applications that are there, and also the suspicious applications. Uh, reboot their, uh, you know, phone on the safe mode. So these are some of the technical awareness that I think everybody needs to have because now everybody is having a mobile phone in their hand. And uh, it must be prioritized by uh, the companies, law enforcement, as well as uh, 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 individuals. Uh, victims of stockware, um, like Rachel had mentioned, uh, that uh, they they need to create a safety plan. I, I think that's also one of the um, and, and I would say that on uh, ground level, there needs to be more awareness on the laws, regulations, the institutions on the rights of everybody. Uh, also, uh, there needs to be um, a lot of uh, uh, capacity development happening. Uh, talking to the therapists, I think uh, today there is a lot of uh, taboo, which is around mental health, uh, which also needs to be uh, broken, especially in societies in developing countries like uh, India, uh, where there is uh, 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 I would also want to touch upon the aspect of individualism in society. For example, in India, for example, uh, there is very, uh, it's a very dependent society. And uh, likewise, even we find this in Africa where, where the dependency is more and individualism is less. When there is more dependency, there is also a scope of uh, many kind of crimes happening. And also uh, the, the use of stock aware and where, where there is some sort of a dependency and that needs to be countered. Uh, so um, uh, these are some of the points that I would wanted to highlight. And uh, I really thank uh, you for this opportunity. Thank you so much. Thank you, Sanjana. And thank you for touching upon uh, some technical details on how people can identify if they might be a, a victim of stalker. Um, just a word to highlight that you can ask your question in the chat or through Twitter. And in particular, if you have technical questions on uh, am I the subject of a stalker, uh, what should I do if it's a case? So go ahead and put it in the chat and we'll try to answer all those technical questions. So thank you very much. And I welcome our fourth speaker, uh, Philippe. Uh, welcome. Um, Philippe, you are with us today from the Netherlands um, because you are head of strategy at uh, the European, European, uh, European Cybercrime Center, the EC3. Uh, Philippe, you are especially in charge of the EC3 strategy against new cyber threats, uh, in charge of driving innovation and developing awareness um, and capacity building in the European Union. Um, and you are also a member of various working groups, including ENISA's advisory group on ad hoc uh, group on artificial intelligence and cryptology. So uh, in one word, Philippe, uh, what is the response from law enforcement agencies and what are your strategy to address the issue? Uh, 
Thank you very much. Well, thank you, Arno, and, and, and thank you for having me. And it's, it's uh, I mean, I have to say what Rachel, Christina, and Sanjana said, you know, really resonate with me. And I, I could almost go like, you know, what they said and yield my time. Um, I think um, um, it's, it's great to see, and that's why this is such an important discussion because it goes way beyond technology, right? So just quickly in terms of providing context. So I work with Europol's uh, European Privacy Center, as you said, so we deal with, uh, you know, combating high tech crime, combating payment fraud, combating child sex abuse online, which uh, also, you know, in line what we heard about, you know, stalker where unfortunately we had, we've seen during the crisis, a huge increase when it comes to online child sex, sexual abuse and the amount of child sexual abuse material. And, and the most recent team deals with dark web, uh, dark web uh, crime. So, um, you know, what we do, you know, as Europol, we don't have policing powers per se, so we're not European FBI, but we're very successful in creating the network to find that, to fight that network, to get the right people um, at, to, to the table. And, and, you know, you said, what is our response? Now, well, I could say from a law enforcement perspective, the gold standard, if you will, is investigations, you know, going after the bad guys, investigating online criminality. What we do very good is um, supporting multinational cross-border investigations. And we already heard that from the previous speakers, this is an international crime. And you can have one person sitting in one country affecting, you know, you know, uh, people in, in, in many different other countries. So that's why I need to have that network. So that's the gold standard, if you will. And of course, law enforcement is uniquely placed to do that. You know, we are usually the ones who can do that, you know, investigate the, 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 the criminals behind it. But I would almost say the platinum standard is actually to prevent the crime from happening. You know, it's better to not have to investigate from to actually prevent it. So that's why, you know, this initiative, this coalition is so important because through prevention and awareness, we can actually be successful. We can hopefully prevent a lot of those crimes, increase cyber security, increase cyber safety and cyber resilience, which goes way beyond technology. So I really like that, all the comments of the previous speakers. So just to give you two examples, one, one operation example is quite old. So 2014, so that's almost six years, obviously. Uh, and that was oper Operation Black Shades, which is also linked to another problem. When we talk about stalkerware and other malware, what we call the crime as a service model, the problem is I don't have to be a technology expert. I don't have to be tech savvy. I can purchase those tools. I can purchase uh, stalkerware online. I don't have to have any te technical, technical knowledge in how to use that. And, and Black Shades was such an example. So it was a massive operation. Uh, we had 16 states involved, including, including US, uh, we arrested 80 people. We had 360 uh, house searches. And just to give you an example, there was an 18 year old person sitting in the Netherlands that had affected, infected 2000 computers. So that was one person affecting 2000 people, not just you know stealing the data, taking pictures using the camera, but having you know, a huge psychological impact, you know, really impacting their lives. So I think that really you know, shows you how, how big of a problem that is. So, um, the, but then, you know, as I said, prevention and awareness. So one of the things we do, for instance, is we have a, a, a very successful, I think, prevention uh, campaign when it comes to the sexual coercion and extortion online of children, where we've developed uh, video material and, 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 and prevention and awareness material that we you know, provide for free on, on our website. So, um, so those are, you know, in, in, in a nutshell, the things that we can do, but we need to have that network. And that, you know, I'm, I'm repeating what the other speaker says that we need to work together. And, and just to sort of finish it, finish it up, I think what Stalkerware really shows you is that connection between cybersecurity and cyber safety. So if, if we simplify it and say cybersecurity is about protecting your data, protecting your infrastructure, uh, and that's important. So having a technical solution to a technical problem, if you will, but cyber safety is really about the human being, the human centric approach. And we've heard that from the other speakers. You know, if I'm affected by, by, by stalkerware, yes, it's a technical problem, but really goes way beyond that. So this is where, you know, we really need to work together. And, you know, we work with one of our academic advisors, uh, Professor Mary Aiken, who's done a lot of work in that space. So we're now working on, on setting up something in the area of cyber safety. She's uh, co-authored a UK report on, on, on safety tech. It's almost like this promotion of a new tech sector that we could create. So, um, you know, again, just to finish, really looking forward to the discussion and it's hugely important to have all these stakeholders uh, at, at the table. Thank you. Thank you, Philippe, and thank you for these uh, examples. Um, let's continue with a, a few questions uh, before going to the Q&A with, uh, with our audience. 
Um, I, the first question I wanted to ask you, um, dear panelists, is why is multi-stakeholder uh, response so important to tackle the issue? And uh, what more can we do together? Um, Sanjana, would you like to start? Uh, yes, uh, so um, I would say that multi-stakeholder approach is needed uh, in society because we are all very dependent. I would say that, uh, for example, if you look into some of the research papers uh, published by Hofstede, for example, that talks about the cultural context uh, and the country culture context, uh, it is seen that uh, there are many developing countries uh, that have very low rate of individualism, which means that there is a lot of dependency in society. Uh, and um, in, in cases, in, uh, for example, in cases you see that there is a lot of dependence, especially uh, for, of women uh, are dependent on other institutions and even uh, their spouse on financial aid, on emotional aspects. So they are not totally independent uh, on every aspect. And uh, this independence, I think, needs to be created. And it can be created only when we have a multi-stakeholder approach, when there is a policy response, as well as when, um, because NGOs cannot really tackle the pro uh, problem holistically and in a, in a sustainable manner. Uh, I, I think uh, there, there needs to be a collective uh, effort. Uh, there needs to be awareness on all the, for example, awareness uh, and training of law enforcement to tackle these issues. Uh, we notice that in the developing countries, uh, there is very less awareness of this kind. And uh, it needs to be, and also training of uh, this, uh, th these cases on how to handle these cases. Uh, we also notice that there is very less of uh, empathy I, I think these are some intangible aspects uh, that needs to be brought into consideration when we deal with social and emotional issues. Uh, and um, there is the empathetic aspect and uh, there needs to be a very comprehensive, uh, I think, curriculum developed. Because um, in most of these countries, and today we are seeing this around the world, uh, that there is an aggression, uh, especially in the in case of there's a lot of police aggression that is uh, happening and there is a sort of mistrust uh, that is being built and uh, this mistrust is also historically because of the fact that many of the dictatorship uh, they 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 had institutionalized police as an oppressive uh, you know an institution of oppression and this needs to change i mean police is not uh, for that uh, police is for the people and this change needs to happen and it can only happen uh, with a multi-stakeholder approach, uh, you know, policy response, um, uh, awareness uh, on various issues, uh, very less dependency, I would say. Uh, I mean, it should not be a compulsion, it should be a choice, everything. So that creates uh, a lot of less dependency. And uh, I think this can happen only collectively and a multi-stakeholder response. Uh, that's all I have to say. Thanks. Um, I don't know, Christina, Rachel, maybe you want to add something on this multi-stakeholder response? Sure, I think uh, Sanjana wrapped it up in a bow for us. I, I don't really have much to say except for right, the right people have to be at the table. Um, and then making sure that, you know, when we when we use this multi-stakeholder approach, that we um, not only have the right people at the table, but then also make sure that the table is accessible for everyone. And what do I mean by that? So we can have these kind of conversations as thought leaders and as, as, as technologists and in advocates, but if a survivor, if the survivors aren't at the table, if the, the folks who live at many intersections and margins aren't at the table, then we are doing this work in vain. And so we have to have the right people at the, t the table to help inform this work because we, we cannot do it without them. And then I think the other part about that that uh, Sanjana you know, touched on was that we have to also start by believing. Many times we, we talk with survivors and especially when you think about the ways in which technology has evolved, um, survivors are often saying, well, no one believes that my lights are flickering on and off. No one believes that my email has been hacked. No one is none. Of, I, I've gone to law enforcement and they're saying that's not possible, but I know my air conditioning was set to hundred degrees and it's hot outside. And so we are working with 
survivors on helping them collect their evidence and identify the ways in which they are experiencing this misuse and then having conversation with our counterparts in 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 legal professions um, saying that these are the things that survivors are experiencing and how do we figure that out because you know with stock aware and even if you think about the internet of things those types of crimes are often um people think that there there's a was a tv show here called the jetsons that they're we're living in in 30 90 and there are ways in which technology has evolved. Uh, we're doing video calls, just like the Jetsons. You know, things are turning on and off, just like the Jetsons. And so it, we we have to identify that these are ways in which survivors are still experiencing abuse and helping helping folks understand what that abuse looks like. But but I'll, I'll wrap it up and say that I think Sanjana really um, really articulated well what what the need is. If I may add to it, um, yeah, I fully agree to everything Sinjana and Rachel said. And if I may just add um, one dimension, one perspective from the coalition's work is um, that this is also exactly um, what the coalition, the idea is behind. So to bring together the expertise from different stakeholders, because um, as I said before, um, stock aware um, is not a technical problem um, as such, and as Rachel has um, emphasized before, it's just another tool of, of, the, of the bigger like power and control mechanism behind. And for us, um, it was very helpful to understand, um, yeah, all these, let's say, structures behind and to give a very like practical example for ex um, uh, is that we as, as coalition want to work towards um, we're working towards various objectives. One of them is to have um, really um, airtight um, technical uh, tools, so to speak, that that helps to to detect stock aware, and and that tool. So thinking of an antivirus um, here that that uh, is already existing in today. Um, this also needs um, a good guidance for the user what to do if the if the um, antivirus detects a stock aware, because um, we. Um, learned then that it's critical to understand you cannot just remove the software like with any other malicious uh, software because if that is done then uh, the, the affected person can be in serious danger because the, the abuser will know that it has been removed the stock aware and this can escalate the, the violence so um, there is really a lot more to to understand and and this is why this work in the coalition is really important for for everyone also um to find uh, cross industry answers uh and not least um this this training that uh, definitely sanjana had mentioned and i believe also rachel and philip um to to really come together and and um exchange the knowledge and and share it so we are working on um yeah on, on creating a basic training and uh, some webinars so we can share the, the let's say, the, the, the expertise from all the stakeholders together. Thank you. Thanks, Christina. Uh, just one question to IGF uh, organizers. I think there is a, an issue with the sound, as I can see uh, speakers uh, uh, hear them speaking two times. So if you can take a look at that, that would be great. Thanks. Um, before we skip to the next part of the, the session, I want to ask panelists the last question. Uh, what's exactly the state, the legal status with Stockware? So we understand there are a lot of issues with this type of software, but they are legal, right? Um, I don't know, maybe uh, Philip, Rachel, uh, can you answer that? What, 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 what is this with the legal status? Can you explain with us why it's not forbidden and what we should do with that? In Sure, I'll speak for uh, what we are experiencing here in the US. So um, we don't actually have an overarching federal law that covers stock aware specifically, um, but each state has its own laws and guidelines uh, uh, to address the problem. But in theory for us, monitoring someone without their consent is uh, just problematic behavior and is a violation of someone's privacy. Um, I, I think it's really great that there are countries out there who are trying to develop harsher punishment and guidelines around this. Um, and I think as we think about the ways in which we have laws on the book, we have to ensure that we have the appropriate law 
um, and the appropriate way to hold offenders accountable through the legal system should a survivor choose that. Um, however, we know um, in, in our legal system that laws are often slow to catch up with the current state of uh, crimes. And so um, even though many states um, have laws on the books um, that can be used to prosecute these types of crime, we're also seeing where um, the, 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 the folks who have to prosecute or, or arrest are struggling with understanding how to make those things stick. And so um, I think uh, we uh, talked earlier about better education for our legal and law enforcement um, uh, friends on what these laws mean so that they can get the right charges brought forward. I think it's also important to note at this point as well that not every survivor wants a criminal recourse or a legal recourse. For many survivors, they just want the surveillance to stop. They want their lives back. And so for survivors who don't want to go through the legal system, um, it's up to companies and agencies to develop strong internal protocols to combat stark aware and monitoring so that survivors can get a, a, a resolution because that may not be an option for them if they don't want that. And, and just adding from, from my perspective really briefly, what we've come to understand is that, um, so the, the software itself, Stalkerware it, as software is um, legal, unfortunately, and just the, the, just the use of it. Um, so if, uh, if it's used without consent um, um, to spy secretly on someone, then it's illegal. Um, that's um, what I've come to understand, at least uh, talking with a police officer here in Germany and what we also understood from, from other countries. So um, it's a very good question that has been asked by the audience. And um, uh, I think uh, it's it's tough question, as Rachel pointed out right now, that survivors or, or uh, victims, um, they may not even want um, stricter laws necessarily, or they don't want to, to um, have to deal with the police. They just want the, the, the surveillance to stop. So it's, again, a delicate balancing act, I would say. Thank you. Is there still time? So I can just quickly come up, come in with my views. Uh, obviously, I think even within the EU, uh, there is this fragmentation when it comes to legislation. You know, we have the Budapest Convention, which is certainly a guiding um, principle, but you know, what it has been, you know, transposed into national law, that's that's sometimes an issue. Um, now, I mentioned, um, and, and Christina, you mentioned, you know, alluded to that. It's the the a lot of times what we see with malware is the, the problem of the preparatory act. You know. Uh, the fact that you have a you know downloaded a stalkerware and sitting on your computer per se most countries that would not be illegal that's not you know a criminal act per se it's then the use but then you know sometimes you do have to be uh, a little bit creative so if it's a tool that can only you know do that and has no other purpose and you're not a security researcher it's going to be very difficult to defend the fact that you have that sitting and purchase that tool online so, but it is a challenge. I think it goes back to uh, what, what you know, Rich, Christina and, and Sanjana said, uh, we need to have a multi-stakeholder response across all different uh, areas. And legislation is one of them, it's very strong, but you know, as, as, as uh, Rachel said, you know, even if it's technology neutral, it takes a while, you know, to catch up. And then, you know, when, once it's there, it's already outdated sometimes. So we need to have policies, we need to have training, awareness, capacity building, the whole range of uh, options that we have to e effectively respond, respond to that. And I maybe if, if I, I can just add one part because this is something which we also, which is very hard because yes, we need to focus on the, on the victims and the survivors, but we also need to understand what drives you know, perpetrators. That's another avenue that we need to, to, to look at or another option we need, we need to look at as well to understand why would people do that? And that per se perhaps can also, you know, turn into into some uh, some sort of prevention and outreach work. Thanks. Thank you, thank you, Philippe. Um, so of course we're already very late. Uh, I guess that's normal. Um, what we would like to do now is uh, ask for your opinion because we would like to have your feedback. I think we have. The audience from all around the globe and it's very useful for us to to really know what people uh, think on the field so what we propose is to do a very quick online poll um, through mentimeter 
Um, so I'm asking Anastasia, could you please share your screen? Um, we'll do that very quickly. And um, so we have already put in the chat um, the, the link on how to connect. It's, you have to go to www.menti.com. Um, just a sec, let me know if you see that already in a minute. In the meantime, I will also leave the link to the poll in the chat. Yeah, so once again, if you can go to www.menti.com, -E um, it's fully anonymous, so feel free to answer whatever you, you like, um, and uh, you don't have to put your name or anything. Great. Oh, we already have some, some answers. So on the top of the screen, you see uh, the code on which you have to connect. Thank you very much, Anastasia. Um, the first one is a very quick question, but uh, it's very useful. We want to know if you have uh, already suspected of being affected by stockware on your smartphone or laptop. Um, so we'll maybe let you 30 seconds to reply. Um, so we see that uh, the large majority is saying no, never, but uh, about one quarter already suspected being affected. So that's quite a lot. Um, let's wait for another 10 seconds. We already had about 20 people answering. So thank you very much. Um, I take this time to say that all of this data will be included in the post event report that will be available on the IGF website after the event. Okay, so thanks. Uh, let's go to the next one. Anastasia, can you please switch? Um, so you have another question here. Um, you should be able to answer uh, once again through the same page. Um, do you think the legal framework efficiently protects victims against stock area in your country or in your region? Well, once again, I think the results are quite clear. I don't see a lot of yes. So about two thirds of respondents say no. Let's give it another five seconds. Okay. Um, thank you very much. Let's go to the next one, please. Um, another question about the legal framework. Um, we just touched upon that, um, but uh, we wanted to ask you, should definitely uh, stockware be legally prohibited? Um, I'm giving the example of France where I live, stockware are allowed. Uh, in fact, it's the illegal use of stockware uh, by spying on someone without his or her consent which is prohibited. And for instance, uh, the geolocation without uh, having someone consent is prohibited. Okay, thank you very much, everyone. Once again, it's very useful. So 79% of people uh, think stock watch should be legally prohibited. Um, we'll skip now to the next and last question. Um, this is an open question. Um, we really like to have your ideas on what we should do. Uh, what are your ideas for multi-stakeholder activities? Um, what would be useful to help victims and supporting organizations on the field? Well, that might be, I don't know, trainings, awareness materials, other tools, or support from law enforcement agencies. Um, if you have any thought, anything you think would be useful, just type in a few words. And uh, once again, we'll, we'll uh, 
really think about that, reflect about that, and have it in the in the post event report. I see the first one saying that digital literacy would matter a lot in this regard, especially in, in developing countries. Okay, thank you very much. So these are uh, propositions and ideas in all fields, uh, either on the legal side or the legal framework on, on multi-stakeholder uh, awareness and capacity building. So that's very useful. Um, what I propose is that uh, we'll now skip to the last section, but uh, you can still vote. Uh, you will be able to continue to voting and putting your ideas uh, on this question. Uh, during the the follow up of the of the event so uh, thank you very much anastasia i think we can go to the next part um, we're supposed to have a, a first round of questions but uh, i propose to do that uh, in the end uh, we'll first go to felix uh, who is being remaining silent from the beginning but uh, who has a lot to say um, so Felix, uh, you are a security researcher uh, within the uh, Kaspersky Global Research and Analysis Team. You are a computer security and geopolitics enthusiast. Uh, you started as a pen tester uh, before joining the French uh, Cyber Security Agency uh, to develop the threat intelligence investigations and related capabilities. And in 2017, you switched to the private sector and joined the uh, Kaspersky's great team. Um, and there you work as a threat intelligence researcher, mainly focused on emerging threats and targeted attacks. Um, so you're with us today to present an ongoing project aimed at facilitating the detection of stalkware and other malicious spyware uh, installed on smartphones and tablets. Uh, I think it's a world premiere, so thanks a lot uh, of you for having this demo with us. Um, so go ahead, the floor is yours, and if you can share your screen. Yeah, so thanks Arnaud. I hope that you, you, you see my screen, the, the presentations. So welcome everyone and thanks here Arnaud for inviting me to this, uh, to this small, small uh, conference. Uh, so this talk is about a new project to detect stalkwares on, on smartphone. Uh, the title is Anti-Stalkware Box and How to Analyze uh, Your Smartphone Communication Without Any Technical Knowledge. Um, well, uh, the idea of this project uh, came to me during a meeting with a French NGO supporting uh, victims of domestic violence, the Center Hubertine Nucléaire in Paris. And this meeting was about how to detect stalker on people's smartphones. And during this meeting, they shared uh, with me their, their like frustration about uh, the detection of stalker as a Obviously, they were like not technical people. And for example, they were not able, obviously, to uh, do some smartphone analysis in order to spot the spy spyware. And uh, after a small documentation uh, about uh, stalkware, uh, just because it's not my day-to-day -day research field, I found that uh, most of them are using like the same infrastructure, which is in most of the case uh, already known and public, publicly known to be associated to the spyware. And so uh, by knowing that, is it possible to check very easily uh, if a smartphone is compromised just by, by looking at its communications? Whoop. So uh, here uh, came to me the idea of uh, creating a kind of open source kiosk for less than like $50 US dollars where people can easily check in a few minutes uh, if their device is compromised or not. And that uh, without any technical knowledge for the end user. Uh, as of today, uh, you, you have a first version that I will present, uh, which have been developed and works uh, quite nicely. Uh, so, so take a look and uh, how it works by looking at a video. So let's play the video. <laughs> so this is a box. Uh, so the first step for the user is to create a Wi-Fi network and connect his smart, its smartphone just by scanning a QR code. So 
uh, you have like the, the generation of the Wi-Fi network. Uh, you scan the network, uh, you scan the QR code to connect to the network. And once connected, so the phone will connect to the box and once connected, the capture starts as a hint, you have like a, uh, you have some spike present in the background, which is like the active communication of the smartphone. Um, so let's wait like a few seconds and let's stop uh, the, the capture and let's go to analyze, analyze it. And if there is some suspect things happens on the wire, uh, the user is going to be alerted directly by this kind of message. And a full detailed report uh, can be uh, seen uh, by the user and of course saved with also the full capture on the USB key. So it can be used for software, but also like for uh, any kind of uh, spyware on mobile phone. So uh, moreover, like uh, this tiny device has a, like an interface to configure it. So uh, you have seen the you have seen the kiosk mode of it, and uh, on a very tiny device, but it can be on a larger screen, of course. And as a threat involved, uh, you can add also your own indicator of compromise uh, related to many uh, creamware, uh, many uh, like state-sponsored APT, stockware, everything. And so today uh, the project is very like fully standalone. So you have on the same device, uh, you have the user interface, uh, the detection engine, the indicator of compromise. Uh, so if you are an organization tomorrow, if some people are quite enthusiastic by this project, uh, the detection engine and all of the handicapper of compromise will be contained on a centralized server where uh, the, the other instance of, the, of this anti stalkware box will be connected uh, to, uh, to get the new indicator of compromise because it's very difficult like for an organization to manage uh, many devices when they are like in standalone uh, cases. So you have like just your user interface and after uh, the server centralize everything. Uh, so uh, the final words of this presentation is uh, first, uh, this project will be uh, open source. Uh, so anybody can install it at home or uh, in different center or NGOs on ev everything. And don't hesitate to can contact us at this email address, just right there. Uh, if, you, if you even want just to say, yeah, your project is cool, let's continue on that. And uh, by contacting us, you can also have an access to the private uh, GitHub repository uh, till its public uh, release in a few weeks. So yeah, uh, don't hesitate to, to contact us. Thank you. Thank you very much, Felix. Um, I think you will receive a lot of emails uh, and I have thousands of questions. I'm sure everybody does. Um, I, I want to ask them now because uh, of course we don't have time. We just have six minutes to uh, to go to the Q&A session. So I'll propose you to uh, give a few questions raised by the audience to our panelists. Um, uh, the first one um, is a very simple one. How can international advocacy organization join the coalition against Stockware? Um, we have a few representatives. Christina? Yes, I'll Christina. just quickly answer it. Uh, just um, go to the website um, stopstockware.org and there you find a form uh, to contact the coalition. Thank you. Um, Another question, um, when it comes to IoT, there seems to be a lack of awareness on the part of the manufacturers as to how the product can be misused. So is the coalition looking to address this? Um, Rachel, Sanjana, maybe? Um, I don't want to speak for the coalition. I will say that um, 
currently we're focusing on stock aware as our main priority. That isn't to say that there aren't groups in that coalition who um, are working around IoT. I know that uh, my agency works with companies like Google um, and other uh, companies that have IoT uh, devices to kind of think through um, what their strategies are, just like there's the coalition against uh, stock aware. Um, there are often safety advisory boards at some of those companies. Um, and so I know that there are NGOs and other folks who, who help assist with that um, and, and help them understand that, again, I think there is a very big difference between programs and software that are um, were created with the intent to harm, um, like stock aware. It was created to to monitor and track someone, and then um, technologies that were created to better our lives, um, but then also being misused. And so I think they're, they're two different things, but we can, we can definitely address them in, in some similar and different ways. I would also like to touch upon uh, one issue that, uh, so when uh, these applications, uh, they, uh, uh, the, the unauthorized applications, in many cases, they are just taken down uh, because they are unauthorized. But however, there are some developers who still give the, these kind of services. So uh, what I would say that, uh, uh, in fact, uh, this was a case that around two months ago, uh, um, uh, I was contacted by one of the uh, you know, developers who was developing spyware applications. Uh, and uh, this was this needs to be reported uh, to relevant authorities, I would say, um, because uh, the the one the softwares that are used for uh, tracking by the government or anything they are all proprietary and they are done using a legal procedure. Uh, however, Stockware it's a different uh, domain altogether. And what I would say is that uh, just get in touch with the relevant authorities, the law enforcement, uh, or write to the coalition against Stockware, and we will look into it. Thank you very much, uh, Philip. You have raised your hand. Um... Yeah, just very quickly in the, in the interest of time. So you mentioned NISA. So NISA is the EU cybersecurity agency and they're working very hard on developing a standardization and, and a labeling system for IoT devices. Now, this is a, a huge undertaking, but it goes in the right direction. You know, for instance, like security and privacy by design. And, and as Rachel said, you know, sometimes this is, you know, unintentional. Those are, however, those, those connected devices are not very often the, the entry point into, into network and can be used for criminals to install all sorts of malware, including stockware. So um, at least at EU level, uh, there, are, there, there are those uh, uh, efforts to, to uh, introduce standardization and a labeling system potentially for IoT devices. Okay, thanks a lot. Um, uh, another question uh, which should be easy, easy to answer um, is, um, is there any report from the coalition with the data you mentioned today? Also, how can we be kept informed about the training webinars? I think I, I wrote a quick answer to it. I'll repeat it. So um, there is a, a report published um, uh, with uh, some of the data I referred to. I, I put the link in the in the chat. And um, yeah, they, the training, we're working on it and we hope to, um, to uh, announce it um, whenever it's finished soon, hopefully. It will be trainings for um, associations or victims and survivors. So the main, the main first um, uh, group we, we want to run the trainings with is uh, so with NPOs working uh, with victims and perpetrators in, uh, of domestic violence. And, and then the, the greater goal is also to work with um, law enforcement agencies agencies and, and regulators, so to also raise awareness and increase capacity there. Mm -hmm. Thanks. Um, I think we only have 30 seconds left. So we had a number of other questions. I'm sorry, we don't have to answer them now, but we'll make sure to answer them, I think, in the post-event report. And you can also uh, find many info uh, on the website of the coalition, so which is also in the chat, stopstockware.org. Um, so thank you very much for joining the, the IGF pre-event today.
we hope it was useful to you. Um, we look forward to continue the discussion with each of you uh, on this important topic. Uh, so for that, feel free to contact either the coalition or directly each speaker. Um, uh, and uh, we are looking to, to discuss with you. Uh, if you are ready for an IGF marathon uh, over the next hour and, and days, uh, there will be a lot of interesting events. Um, I recommend you in particular a very interesting workshop on the assurance and transparency uh, in ICT supply chain security next week. Uh, Philippe, I think you will be also a speaker on November 12. And um, that's one of uh, many of the very interesting events to come. So thanks a lot to our panelists, Rachel, Sanjana, Christina, Philippe, and Felix, our online moderators, Anastasia and Balint, and also to all the IGF staff and uh, volunteers for making this discussion possible. Thanks a lot and keep in touch. Stay safe. Bye-bye. Thank you. Thank you. Bye. Um, process. Well done. Pottis, are you around? Yes, I'm here. Okay. Um, we'll soon be closing the room. I, I hope um, most of our attendees saw the feedback form and um, all things been equal. Uh, I look forward to working with you. My name is Adebo Kimbo for the record. I'm sorry, the the audio just cut a little bit. I don't want to answer. Come again. The audio just cut a little bit, and I can't hear you. Oh, okay, okay. I said um, I look forward to working with you one more time. My name is Adebumi Akimbo. I uh, hope we'll continue our discussion on the WhatsApp room. Oh, okay. It's a pleasure for me. Okay, so um, we end the meeting now. Uh, I think we just have to stop the live. Come again? The, we have to click and to stop the live button. Yes, I know, I know. But we still have Abu, we have Nahir, and we have Shiva still online. So I do just want to cut it anyhow. We have two attendees on, still online. I just wanted oh, them to move. Okay. We'll be cutting it now. Okay, just Shiva. Just Shiva so, right now. Yes. Well, uh, the, the live in YouTube, I think we can uh, end it. Oh, it's, uh, it's already ended. Okay. So um, let's let's um, take our leave. Have a nice time. Stay safe. You too. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.